the movie preview critic, informing and entertaining your movie world. What's up, good movie lovers? Welcome to a movie review for Shutter Island. If you haven't listened to a movie review with me, the movie preview critic, the major thing to know is that I ruin the movie. I spoil everything talking about all the details because if we're gonna go deep and try to analyze a film, we gotta get into the DNA, we have to talk about all that stuff. So if you don't want to have all the surprises ruined, and for Shutter Island there are a lot of them, please don't listen to the rest of this review. But I will say that it's definitely worthy of big screen viewing, but see it at a matinee price because while it does work well as a film, it isn't that different from similar types of stories that have already been on the big screen. And we should see it in the theater because it is Martin Scorsese. Let's give him some box office success so he can continue to make movies in the future. And as of this recording, it has made $40 million its opening weekend. So let's do a quick five second count to give you some time to turn this off. Five, four, three, two, one. In order to break the film down, let's just start with a quick review of the story, and then we're going to get into the areas that worked and didn't. So to start with, we have to know that this movie has a twist ending, which transforms the meaning of everything we've seen up until this climax. Which means that it's similar to films like The Sixth Sense, Fight Club, The Others... Mulholland Drive from the point of view of movies that do those twist endings. This is based on a book written in 2003 and that's an interesting point for us because 1999 was the year when Fight Club and Sixth Sense came out and especially Sixth Sense that was sort of the catalyst which created this twist ending craze in Hollywood for the next couple of years and that's where you get films like Mulholland Drive and the others coming out as well as Vanilla Sky. But now it's seven years later we're kind of over the whole twist ending thing we're, and one of the problems Problems is that Shutter Island doesn't necessarily rejuvenate or do something new with that already burnt out genre. It's a little bit after the fact. It's that party goer who shows up when the janitors are sweeping up and the dance floor is empty. With that said, it totally is a technical success for Martin Scorsese and everyone involved. The acting is great, the cinematography is awesome, the location, the costumes. It's a really well crafted film, except in terms of the screenplay. Not that it's necessarily a bad story, I'm sure it follows the book really closely, and it kind of does that to a fault because it ends up being more of a technical and psychological success more than a dramatic one. And we'll get in depth into that area in just a second, but first the quick summary of the story is that you have Leonardo DiCaprio playing a U.S. Marshal named Teddy and Mark Ruffalo playing another Marshal named Chuck. They arrive at this island, which is controlled by the hospital's chief physician, played by Ben Kingsley, whose character is Dr. John Cowley. And they're on the island because it's a federally funded hospital, and one of the patients in a secure cell has managed to escape. So it sets up a really interesting mystery, and now Teddy and Chuck have to examine the island and discover, okay, what's really going on in the preview makes you think that Dr. John and his staff and everybody is in on some kind of conspiracy and it looks like by the end Teddy and Chuck will be captured and, and become part of the inmate population and no one will ever hear from them again. Now the twist is that like The Sixth Sense, like Vanilla Sky and, and Mulholland Drive and the others and twisty movies of that kind of genre, it turns out that everything we've seen has been an elaborate role-playing therapy game developed by Dr. John in order to snap Teddy out of his delusion. So the twist is that Teddy has been an inmate at Shutter Island for about two years because he shot his wife who drowned their three children. And Chuck, Teddy's partner, is actually his chief attending physician. And everyone on the island's been assigned a role based on Teddy's fantasy, and they made it come to life so that at the end they can show him that it is all a delusion, snap him back to reality, and make him face the truth that he killed his wife. First question we have to ask, does the twist work? Because when you're doing any kind of twist in a movie, it has to do two things. It has to be logical and make sense based on everything that we've seen before. Because the nature of a twist ending is that it takes everything we've seen and gives it a whole new meaning. The original meaning is there, but then it adds new information which makes us examine it in a totally different way so that now when you watch it a second time, it works on that level as well. A good example of this would be M. Night Shyamalan, again, 
Batman, who didn't necessarily start the genre of the twist, but kind of brought it into vogue. The Usual Suspects is another great example of this that predates The Sixth Sense. As long as it adds to the story, maintains logic for what came before, and makes us look at it in a different way, we're fine with it. It also has to maintain emotional impact. Don't just do it to mess with us. Do it because it's going to affect us on an even more powerful level, which I think... Mulholland Drive does that in a great way, and there's a lot that this movie, this novel, this original story could have learned from watching that film and taking the way it approached this kind of twisty genre. Scorsese demonstrates that he's still the master of the directing craft. He takes this script, brings it to life, and puts his touch on it. We definitely see some signature Scorsese moves, especially at the beginning where the security guard is explaining to the marshals how the layout of the island is, and he says, this is wing A and this is wing B. And the camera never cuts, it just is like these whip pans side to side, very Scorsese-ish. And it's also great to see him using CGI. It's Scorsese also giving a little homage to Hitchcock, where when you have Teddy Daniels going up the stairs, very similar to the clock tower in Vertigo, Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo with Jimmy Stewart, who also plays kind of like this semi kind of delusional character, but it doesn't go into fantasy. It's more people are kind of messing with him, and he doesn't know what's real or what's not, but there's this great similar shots going on where he's running up the stairs, and it's kind of this spiral. So it's very much a Vertigo-y kind of story. And let's also mention The Shining. Very similar kind of spooky tonality going on here. I'd love to see him take the next bold step and make a sci-fi picture that would be a little bit out of directing character and a new challenge for him but if uh, Kubrick did it why not the editing here also since I mentioned the dream sequences is outstanding again Thelma Schoonmaker who's been with Martin Scorsese for a long time editing most if not all of his movies since at least Raging Bull her work here is really great and it adds to this disorienting mental kind of state which is set up in that early on it seems that Marshall Teddy is correct in suspecting Dr. John and his staff of working with the government to experiment on people in order to create basically zombie soldiers that'll do CIA cloak and dagger kind of stuff and the island becomes a terrifying place where you have all the different buildings representing different levels of the patients in terms of how violent they are and dangerous and and then there's the lighthouse which is the place where the lobotomies happen which we discover later on should also mention that the setting is really interesting it's an island and much like lost the film and the story make a location interesting and, and give it personality So far, it sounds like it should be a great story, should be really interesting. Now, let's get into one issue, is that what keeps us watching a movie? There's a concept in screenwriting known as drive. Basic definition is that it's something that keeps you interested in a film. We have the drive of the objective. What is the character after? The genre drive, which means that you stay interested in the movie because you want to see the genre set pieces. If it's an action film, you want to see more explosions. So even if the characters of the story aren't that interesting, you're going to keep watching because you know the next set piece is going to be amazing. (coughs) Transformers 2, really interesting opponent, and they're just totally dominating the story, just like the Joker in The Dark Knight. You could watch it because of the actors. Hey, you like a Julia Roberts movie or George Clooney? So I just want to watch them because their pretty faces are on the big screen and I'll sit in the theater for two hours. I don't mind if they're in a piece of crap film. You could see it here for the director factor. It's a Martin Scorsese film and I don't care what he does. He can film somebody making breakfast and I would pay $20 just to check that out. And the drives really never stop. But in terms of a screenplay kind of technical structure, it's more in terms of characters, objective, opponent, genre, maybe theme is interesting to you seeing someone change. So what is it here in Shutter Island that keeps us watching? You could say it is Martin Scorsese, the director. You could say it's Leonardo DiCaprio, Mark Ruffalo, Ben Kingsley. Michelle Williams has an amazing performance in the film. So there's a lot of factors in terms of that. But if you're here for the story, which also relates to the opponents in the film and the characters and their objective and who they are as people and their personalities it falls a little bit short because the first half of the film you don't know that it's going to be twisting the drive of two federal marshals looking for a missing patient at a mental hospital that's on an island with opposition coming from the psychologist dr john who rules the island and everyone's scared to talk because he seems like a much more dangerous person than he is and he himself might be crazy this might be like an island of dr moreau And he's gone mad and everyone's too scared to say anything. Maybe he's done something to everybody and he's got them under total control. So thoughts like that keep you wondering, okay, well, when are they going to run into trouble and what's going on? It works for a little while, 
But the problem is that those elements of the story aren't developed well enough. The characters here have two problems. They're a little bit flat, their personalities aren't all that interesting, and they don't pursue their own personal objectives enough. If Dr. John is supposed to be opposing the marshals, then he needs to do it a little bit stronger. Now you could say that, okay, this is Teddy's delusion, so everyone involved in this role-playing can't change the delusion to make it more entertaining. Well, since it is based on a novel, and since it is a fictional delusion, it's not based on a true story, then the writer should pump it up a little bit, make it a little bit more interesting. On that dramatic level, which drama is basically the conflict between two opposing sides, two people fighting over their objectives. So if Teddy wants to find out what's going on on the island and he believes there's some kind of CIA conspiracy going on that Dr. John and everyone's involved with, then Dr. John needs to be more menacing, more active. Everyone needs to be an opponent. If Dr. John isn't on the screen, then all the orderlies and the patients and the security guards, they're doing things to threaten and stop Teddy and Chuck. It needs to be a little more active. Then again, you could say, well, then that would turn it into more of like a thriller action film. Can't it be a little slower, a little moodier. And I'm going to bring up the example of Mulholland Drive, which is a totally slow film. I'll mention why a little bit later when we talk about making some changes to Shutter Island to make it work possibly a little more dramatically. But the thing with Mulholland Drive is that each scene, it has this level of bizarreness to it. Again, it's a David Lynch film, so maybe that drive of watching it because it is a David Lynch film is keeping people interested. There's such a strange tone and the interaction between characters in that film, it's so different from what we've seen before. Here in Shutter Island, it's very typical kind of like Philip Marlowe, Humphrey Bogart, Maltese Falcon kind of, yeah, okay, I'm a private eye looking for the killer and trying to crack this mystery. And you get this very kind of been there, done that, noirish kind of detective story going on. And it's not different enough. It's almost like this delusion has been informed by movies that this character had seen, and he's kind of made it cliche and a little bit been there and done that before. With Mulholland Drive, it's just every scene has this strangeness to it, like, and a little bit of absurdity too, and it doesn't reveal that it's a dream or kind of this psychotic fantasy break that this character is having. It's strange, but yet realistic enough to make you think, okay, what's going on? Mulholland Drive actually has a similar main character objective where you have Naomi Watts looking for a woman that's disappeared. Both Shutter Island and Mulholland Drive have that similar objective going, and the way that it's handled in Mulholland Drive is a little more subtle, but a little more creepy, where each scene just has this uneasiness to it, and you know that just the truth is going to be disturbing, and you slowly build towards that revelation and each scene you just keep watching because it just crawls it keeps inching towards an interesting resolution that you can't really predict so you're questioning everything you don't start guessing what's going to come ahead because there's not a lot of sense it is a little bit absurd offers answers but then it asks more questions but the way it's presenting the story kind of puts it into that mystery genre where it's not so much action and thrills now in shutter island you don't necessarily need guns being shot and people chasing each other but take advantage of what the delusion, what the paranoia of this fantasy is, which would be that the guards and the doctor would capture these marshals and start injecting them with things and maybe they could escape. Just make it a little more active or make the opposition a little more passionate, a little more into what they're doing. The major reason Mulholland Drive does this similar story a little bit better because the twist is a little bit different where in Mulholland Drive, if you haven't seen that film, I'm going to give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. The twist ending being that Naomi Watts has been having a fantasy the whole time because in reality, she actually put a hit on a female lover that she had and the woman broke up with her and married another guy and we've seen all the characters in this fantasy kind of rearranged and mixed up and playing different roles and when she comes out of the fantasy we get to see what the reality is and who everyone is and that she's basically fighting her guilt and it's eating away at her and making her go crazy and during that dream fantasy sequence there's no indication that this is a dream that it is a delusion and the problem with Shutter Island is that it starts revealing its secrets a little bit too early. Now, it does try to keep you in that reality by explaining all these revelations when it says that the doctor 
has given him a pill to take for his migraine, and he's drank the water, he's eaten the food, he smoked the cigarettes, and it seems that he's been drugged, and these are the delusions of the drugs. But then there's the moment where Teddy climbs down this rock cliff, and this piece of paper that Chuck was holding sort of it just flies up, and it happens to land on a rock right next to Teddy. It's way too convenient. And then he crawls into this cave and finds this missing character that ended up being a doctor, and she reveals the whole secret to him. And you just think, this, there's no way this could be real. It's a little bit too convenient, a little bit too unbelievable, and at that point, we still believe enough that this is the reality going on, that Teddy isn't a patient and that this isn't his delusion. So it sort of ruins it. There are these Fight Club little moments where, in Fight Club, it's famous for having these quickly inserted shots of Tyler Durden before we meet Tyler Durden, indicating that he's a figment of Edward Norton's character's imagination. Same thing with The Sixth Sense, where if you go back and watch it again, the conversations seem like the characters are talking to each other, but when you view it again, you can totally believe that dinner scene when Bruce Willis and his wife were having this really uncomfortable, cold conversation with each other, that he actually wasn't there, that and that she was just doing some kind of therapeutic healing kind of anniversary dinner. You believe that, but here these moments start to violate the authenticity of this perceived reality a little bit too much, and it ruins it for you. There's this other moment where Teddy's questioning one of the inmates, and she wants a glass of water, and when she takes the water and starts drinking it, there's a couple quick shots, and you see her bringing her hand to her face, and she's actually not drinking any water, then it cuts back to the glass and it's empty, and you think, whoa, what was that? And you get the sense that, oh, something's not right here. I kind of went into this already expecting a little bit of some kind of twist because just from the preview, it seems like it can't just be this simple. And the opening shot, we got to give some credit here to Scorsese. Opening shot, it's a metaphor for the film where you start with this white blank canvas and it slowly turns into fog. And then we have a boat emerging through the fog, traveling across the waters, towards this island and then we cut to the first shot on board the boat and it's teddy throwing up saying it's only water it's only water little symbol of what the rest of the movie is going to be in that the oceans are the oceans of the unconscious in the mind and the island is consciousness and the different buildings on shutter island represent different aspects of maybe super ego id and ego possibly it also represents different levels of memory containment and repression where the most dangerous memories not just inmates the inmates are symbolizing the physicalization of memories and that would play into the whole idea of who is 67 and 67 is that inmate that patient that person that's most hidden on the island in the most secure facility and teddy is traveling to his consciousness to that land that's above the water because below it is the unconscious along with the rest of the ocean and most of the movie is Teddy's struggle to get into Building C, which has the strongest sense of security in terms of hiding the memory that's caused Teddy to go kind of insane and into this defense mechanism mode to maintain his remaining sanity by creating a delusion to protect his crumbling world. And then, of course, there's the lighthouse, which represents enlightenment and a beacon, a beacon towards gaining self-knowledge, which is also off-limits and extremely dangerous, and Teddy's warned many times not to go to. And the boat is the personality or the person traveling through this, and it would make sense that Teddy is afraid to travel through it because he's going to uncover the truth, and the whole purpose of having a delusion is to avoid the truth. It's a defense mechanism. You want to stay away from what the hard reality is, so you create this make-believe that's going to keep you safe and happy. And from that point of view, this opening shot is one of the great ones that I can remember. One of my personal favorites also is Francois Truffaut in his classic creation, 400 Blows, which opens up with a kid in a classroom and everyone's passing around a book until it comes to him. And throughout the rest of the film, he's going to be passed around. No one wants him. The parents are always fighting and teachers don't respect him and his friends turn their back on him. And by the end of the film, he ends up at the ocean and he can't run anymore. There's nowhere else left to go. So Scorsese just showing off a little bit here, doing one of the toughest things in movies is that can that opening shot be thematic and symbolic of what we're going to see throughout the rest of the movie. Let's jump now to the big revelation, with the problem being that you already start to suspect there's going to be some kind of twist and revelation early on because of all these little clues that are a little bit too obvious. There's two factors affecting it having power. The first being that there hasn't been enough main character, objective, opponent, conflict, and drama 
to keep us interested and build towards a climax where the revelation is going to have impact. The second factor is that the revelation stops the movie and you sit there for three or four minutes and it's like, okay, class, we're in session. This is Shutter Island. What did it all really mean? And I'm Dr. John and I'm going to explain to you what we've just been doing for the last two hours. Vanilla Sky does the same thing. And if you haven't seen Vanilla Sky, it's also been out a while. Here's a three second spoiler countdown for you. Turn it off if you don't want to ruin. Three, two, one. It turns out that Tom Cruise's character, his face has been deformed the whole time and he actually didn't meet this great girl and he's just been making this all up because he wants to live in a world where he's accepted. And we sort of believe it, but there is someone explaining it. So here you have an anticlimactic revelation of everything. Mulholland Drive for me is a movie that just does it amazingly well because it doesn't answer the questions itself. It has all the pieces there and it expects us to be paying attention and putting it all together on our own. Again, if that movie is about a woman who put a hit out on her girlfriend because she dumped her, it takes us to the climax in a dramatic way in that there's always been movement forward within the story, that there's been this search for where's the missing girl, can you find her? The whole purpose of the opponents in the fantasy is basically part of the defense mechanism that's trying to keep your consciousness from becoming aware of what the truth is because you can't face that truth, it's too painful, it's too hurtful, you're going to be unable to continue living in quote unquote reality if that truth becomes known to your consciousness. So you create these defense mechanisms to keep you distracted, to keep you believing in the fantasy, to expand on the fantasy in order to keep you away from reality. So in Mulholland Drive, you have a prolonged search for this missing girl that just keeps going on because within the fantasy, the defense mechanism part of the brain keeps making obstacles so you can't discover it. And if you are able to reach the end where in Mulholland Drive it's symbolized by this kind of Hellraiser blue box with this key, and you unlock it, and you unlock the secret. And we were taken back into the true reality, and Naomi Watts realizes what she's done, and she ends up killing herself. And it doesn't answer the questions with someone standing at a blackboard saying, here's, I mean, literally, in Shutter Island, there is a blackboard. It's like, okay, audience, it's 2010. And your minds have been rotting away from 10 years of reality TV, so you might not understand what's going on. Let me literally step to a blackboard so you can understand what happened in this story. Please give us Mulholland Drive. Give us credit for having smart brain think. We can do it. Believe in us. Mulholland Drive just gives you the pieces and ends the movie giving you enough of a picture so that all you have to do is just kind of rearrange a little bit of it on your own and you can say, wow, I figured it out. There it is. Now let's get into the rewrite portion of how we could have made Shutter Island a little bit better. The whole thing of a twist story of a mystery like this is you have to know the end ahead of time. You start with the complete picture is basically a puzzle. Let's imagine that it's made out of glass, but there's a picture on it. And you throw the puzzle, it shatters into a hundred pieces. And we're basically just going to reorganize all these pieces so that they look a little bit different and when you look at it from far away as a complete picture it doesn't make sense but when you start to kind of piece them together it all reveals itself nicely and logically so here the truth is and we see it in a really nice flashback I do like the flashback and the acting in it and the dramatic moment and it's really the money shot Oscar moment that Leonardo DiCaprio, if he were nominated for his performance in this film, this moment could be up there on the screen where he returns home as this war veteran who has been drinking. He's seen the horrors of the Holocaust and all the dead bodies, and he's killed German soldiers out of rage, and it's transformed who he is, and it turns out his wife is a manic depressive and she's kind of delusional herself and he's been drinking to avoid the truth which nicely implies that he was a person who would be prone to escaping reality and alcohol would be the first step and then creating a psychological delusion would be the next extreme measure because he can't handle what he's about to do which is return home discover that his wife has snapped she's killed their three children by drowning them he realizes what she's done great emotional reaction totally just a emotionally affecting moment of the movie and he ends up killing her because he's just so enraged and in disbelief and you get this sense that's not said it's really well directed and really well acted that he kind of wants to put her out of her misery a little bit because she is insane but it is more 
on the edge of he's enraged, quietly enraged and torn apart by what's happened. His family has fallen apart, been taken away from him. The guilt is going to start there in that he should have gotten her help because she was talking and the things that she thought she was feeling. And he says to himself, you know what? I should have done something. I should have gotten her help. But instead I was drinking and I avoided it. So because I didn't do anything, I'm responsible for her dying because I shot her and I didn't do anything. And I'm also responsible for my children dying. So it's that guilt that is just crushing him. And this movie, really quickly, by the way, ends. Real great line. Love the line that Leonardo DiCaprio says at the end. To kind of back up again real quickly is that Dr. John when he does that blackboard teaching moment of here's what the whole delusion and this movie was about, he says that this is our final chance of trying to cure you, of trying to bring you out of your fantasy because it happened once, but you retreated again, once again to escape reality into your make-believe delusion. And if it doesn't work this time, you're going to have to be lobotomized because you're violent, which we don't see in the film. They say that they have to lobotomize him because he's been hitting the other patients. There's a there's a character named George Noyce here, played by Jackie Earl Haley, best known as Rorschach from Watchmen. He's also playing Freddy Krueger in the upcoming Nightmare on Elm Street remake or reboot. And he's totally beaten up, so you see the effects of the violence, and there's an earlier moment where he's choking this patient, and he almost kills him. You get a sense of it, but the film kind of fails to give him this menacing aspect to his personality the whole time. It would have worked a little bit better and been a little more engaging during the delusional part of the story if he would have constantly been on edge, ready to snap, ready to punch, ready to hit, just totally feel like this character is on edge. And they do these flashbacks in the film of him as a soldier in World War II, which establishes why he could have been prone to violence and all the things he's gone through. And it could have worked. It would have made us believe that, okay, wow, I can see why that everyone would be scared of him and that a lobotomy would be in order because there's no way to restrain him. There's no way to give him a peaceful life. He seems a little bit too calm. The character isn't developed enough in that aspect of it. But the final line is great because after they bring him out of his psychosis and he accepts reality and he says, yeah, I killed my wife and she killed our kids, he's sitting on the steps the next day with the Mark Ruffalo character who now it's revealed that it's his doctor. And he sits down next to DiCaprio, and he says, how's it going? And DiCaprio answers by calling him boss. And that was in Teddy's delusion, Chuck was known as boss. Now the Dr. character realizes, okay, he slipped back into his fantasy. And he looks over to Dr. John, and he just gives him this nod, and the orderlies start walking towards DiCaprio, which means, okay, we're going to have to give you the lobotomy. Before DiCaprio leaves, he says, being on this island makes me wonder one thing. Is it better to live as a monster or die as a hero? It's basically giving you that implication of, uh-oh, he really is back in reality, but he would rather be lobotomized so he could totally forget the truth of the reality. He would rather pretend that he's this noble marshal who's investigating this conspiracy on this island, then live as a monster. Really well done. There's a final shot of the lighthouse after that. It could have ended with a shot kind of moving in on DiCaprio instead of him getting up and walking with the orders because we know before that happens what this means. He's going to go to the lighthouse. And the lighthouse is the symbol of the lobotomy which in his fantasy. And the final shot is of the lighthouse. The shots are a little bit unnecessary, and it would have been nice to have kind of a little tighter bookend with the opening amazing great symbolic metaphoric image from the beginning now to do the rewrite we have to incorporate the knowledge of this ending because that line is so perfect it just adds a whole nother level to it really well done the problem is basically from the revelation moment it's that third act of how everything that's come before gets twisted and the lack of dramatic emotional impact in that final third act. There's not a lot of emotional impact during the film. There's a couple moments when we see Teddy as a soldier in Germany and he's seeing the horror of the Holocaust. We have emotional reactions there. But other than that, nothing that anybody does really has this emotional impact which any story needs to have in order to keep us connected. We need to be feeling what the characters are feeling. And you could say that, okay, Teddy's defensive and it's a delusion and everyone's pretending to be who they are during this 
experimental kind of pretend therapy, this let's put on a mental therapy play thing where maybe not everyone, okay, is naturally an actor, so they can't give you great emotional performances. But again, it's all made up anyways. It's a movie, so let's direct these performances a little bit better. Or maybe through Teddy's eyes, he's imagining that these people's reactions are stronger than they really are. So he can be interpreting the data that he gets from people into a stronger, more impactful kind of way that makes him think he really is in this conspiracy reality that he's created. So let's rewrite this in that for the revelation to have a stronger impact, the Act 1 and Act 2 have to have stronger character personalities. Teddy needs to be a little more developed, make him a little bit crazier, make him a little more emotionally reactive to everything, increase Dr. John's menacing kind of quality don't make him the bad guy that twirls his mustache but make him someone who obsessively believes in control thinks he's the master of his little universe here thinks he's a genius make him believably evil no one again really sits there and thinks i'm evil they think that oh i know what's going on they have this kind of god complex megalomaniacal kind of attitude that i'm right and nothing i do is wrong and in their own delusion they think they're infallible they think they're just perfect so make him that obsessive where the rights of other people don't matter make the guards sure of what they're doing maybe imply that they're under control that they've been experimented on with drugs and their personalities have been changed maybe they're under dr john's control make them a little more aggressive put chuck the mark ruffalo character in more danger he's teddy's perceived partner so maybe early on there's a more dramatic way that chuck disappears that sends teddy into a more panicked frenzy in order to have teddy feel more tense more danger you have to threaten the delusion you have to threaten all the pieces within the delusion within this made-up story that are defending this delusion so the more steps are taken towards the truth the more violent everything becomes want to bring up a possible solution here as i was sitting there i was thinking okay what's the twist going to be and what does it all mean there's this element of the story that also adds to the unbelievability of it all being staged in that a hurricane hits the island and a hurricane and a storm, perfect total metaphor and symbol for the thought process, for a person's mind. Again, going back to the ocean, the rough waters and the storm of thinking, if Teddy's delusion is being threatened, it would make sense that there would be a hurricane. It would make sense that the waters of the mind are being tossed around at this island that represents consciousness is being torn apart by this threat of truth which is creating this hurricane right it's like a hurricane of reality that's threatening to unsettle this delusion and during the hurricane there's a lot of flashes and the way that these flashes are filmed again looks great cinematography is awesome it almost seems like that there's this other reality and teddy is being electrocuted right there's this electrotherapy going on so you almost expect that the twist at the end is that there's going to be a bright flash and Teddy's going to wake up and he's in some room and he's just undergone electrotherapy in order to kind of snap him out of his delusion. So what if that was the way that he snaps out of this whole fake story in that the storm and these flashes from the outside have all been attempts in reality to destroy the grip of this delusion and have the lightning represent the shocks to the system and they have the storm represent the chaos of truth that's trying to unsettle his fantasy and bring him back into reality then when he wakes up in act three we can see a shot of him in his bed in the cell or whatever and there isn't an explanation there and incorporate the flashbacks so one element here at the end of this movie as it is we get the flashback as a whole of how his kids died and how he shot his wife. Let's see that in a little more interesting kind of Mulholland drivey kind of way where we have to put the pieces together. Don't necessarily give us the whole filet mignon at one time. Let us have bites of it along with the broccoli and the side dishes. Let us kind of mix it all and taste it on our mental palate and close our eyes and try to put the pieces together on our own. So the delusion needs to have its own structured story with emotional impact, with characters fighting for objectives, in that story now that when he comes out of the delusion the character structure objective opponents in that reality all make sense and put a new twist on what we've seen before so here as teddy wakes up the electric shocks have worked have snapped him out of it maybe there's a final electric shock which finally organizes this flashback and we get to see it the only reason to keep this flashback where teddy kills his wife and he sees his dead kids is that it's really acted well and it's just such a powerful emotional impact that it would be better if we get to see glimpses of it in kind of a morphed 
mixed up delusional mind kind of way earlier on. We do see it where he has flashbacks of the concentration camps and the prisoners or the dead bodies. And the dead bodies turn into the characters of what turn out to be his wife and the children. And just give us more of that so that when we see this electric shock kind of bringing all the pieces together flashback at the end that oh it all makes sense just give us the flashback without the explanation we can put it together ourselves then bring him back into the reality have dr john and mark ruffalo ask him these questions briefly all we need is just a phrase something that he says that indicates oh we know that he's back into the reality now and the doctors can just look at each other and before you end that scene you can have ben kingsley and mark ruffalo talk to each other mention something that this is the last chance that the lobotomy would be the only solution because again dicaprio's character is so violent you could possibly set it up establish it within the fantasy because whatever's in the fantasy is going to have new meaning here you can have a character that's in the fantasy that's being threatened with a lobotomy if he doesn't calm down so take a character in the C word, right, where the criminally insane go to be restrained because they can't be near anyone that's on the verge of being lobotomized. And there's some experimental therapy going on with that character within the delusion. And that character turns out to be the DiCaprio character. If this film really wanted to be ballsy, I'd recommend this, that the Jackie Earl Haley character, George Noyce, in the fantasy is actually DiCaprio in reality. So DiCaprio, as DiCaprio, as we see him as Leonardo, would just be in the fantasy portion, and when he comes back into reality, he's actually Jackie Earl Haley. And then we see the character of George Noyce is DiCaprio the actor in reality. So just switch it up so that it would make sense that in the fantasy, Jackie Earl Haley is who's being treated and is being threatened with lobotomy if they don't calm down have him be the one who's really violent show us the violence that way and we see dicaprio in the fantasy as the marshal and it doesn't throw us off yet but when we wake up we learn that that in order to protect himself the character also changed the way that he looked in the fantasy so that the elements of reality didn't spoil the delusion for him so i hope that makes sense you basically you keep the characters who they are, but you're changing the actor. And I think that would have helped the twist work a little bit better. And if we would have developed the DiCaprio character, his emotional reactions, it would have had a little more impact. Less exposition, just have him wake up. He now realizes the reality. We know what's at stake. In the delusion, the threat was already established that a lobotomy is next. So all we need in the final scene is Jackie Earl Haley now playing the DiCaprio character in reality talking to Mark Ruffalo, saying that great, amazing line that, is it better to live as a monster or die as a hero? And then Mark Ruffalo could have a reaction. And after he says that line, there needs to be some kind of logical cut to a white flash because this opened up with blankness, right? A brain as, as if it were lobotomized, nothing there. And let's just go back to a quick reference of Total Recall. The final shot there is a fade out of light in the director's commentary on that. And I'm not going to give you a spoiler countdown for that film because that's almost 20 years old and it's such a classic. It's in my top 10. So shame on you for not seeing it. But it turns out that Quaid is going to be lobotomized. That's Paul Verhoeven's take on it, that fade to white is a sign that it was all a fiction created in Quaid's mind because the program went wrong. I kind of don't believe it still. We'll have to do a movie night on Total Recall because such a great movie in terms of action and sci-fi and everything really works well with Total Recall. Here, we need to have a similar ending. Let's have a little bit of a mirroring going on where the opening scene is a hint in itself at a lobotomy because it's it's whiteness and it's the fog, right? The fog of memory. Such a great symbol in the bow. The person traveling through their own consciousness. It really works. So let's have something similar to that going on here. The lighthouse is a great symbol of something that's signaling home, signaling the safety, right? The lighthouse signals the boat is where home is, bringing you in safely through the rough waters. The lighthouse could be used here. Maybe he's in the room and out through the window, the lighthouse is actually working. The light is going around. Maybe it's dark out. And as it comes around through the window, the brightness is filling the room. And as it keeps revolving, the camera comes in close on the DiCaprio character, now in reality played by Jackie Earl Haley again. And we just get the close-up on him and the white light. Maybe just previously the doctors had left the room because now they know that he's still in his fantasy or he told them that line which makes them believe he's in their fantasy. Of course you have to linger on at least the Mark Ruffalo character and give us a little indication that he totally doesn't believe it in this version 
that is in theaters and the one that's been made, the pre-rewrite version, we get this kind of look from Mark that, uh-oh, I think he's lying, but I also sympathize with him. I know why he would want to do this. And it's such a great, oh, it's so well done. It's such a perfect, perfect, makes sense, really works well. So in our rewrite here, keep that reaction because it just implies the bond. You know, we don't even need to see the reality scenes of these two as patient doctor and how Mark cares for this person. Just show that reaction. And as Mark closes the door, we cut to the DiCaprio character, again, played by Jackie Earl. I got to keep saying that because I myself am getting mixed up. We see the light and we just come in closer and closer and we know what's coming. The room slowly brightens from the symbolic spotlight of the lighthouse we know a lobotomy is on the way. Fade to black, that's it. And cut from there. Keep it white. Have the credits in black text going over white. This should be like A Beautiful Mind, where the moment when we learn that the Russell Crowe character as having this secret operative job working with the Ed Harris character is all a fantasy, that the Ed Harris character is a delusion. So well done, because there's no hint of it at all. We totally believe it the whole time, and the moment his wife walks into the room and sees this paranoid delusion, newspapers cut up everywhere, and that he believes in this crazy fantasy, so well done. And we ourselves, I remember sitting in the theater watching that, I felt like a person who had just had a delusion. And this Shutter Island fails to give that impact because... We are not in the head of the main character's delusion. We are not sharing that delusion along with that character just the way that we did in A Beautiful Mind. The reason it fails is that we break with the reality before the main character does, and we should be with them. We should not be ahead of them. Yeah, Shutter Island, I can believe this is just two detectives. I came in here expecting a kind of a noir 1950s just crack the case sort of story, and oh wow, it was all delusion the whole time. I didn't expect that. But there's too many hints early on that get you thinking, wow, there's something going on. You don't necessarily believe that it's the drugs given to DiCaprio by Dr. John that are making him hallucinate. You feel that it's too unbelievable. There's got to be something more. I still can't get over. Literally, there's a blackboard. That's like the antithesis of dramatic impact. Overall, this is worthy of big screen viewing, as mentioned in the beginning. Check it out as a matinee. It's not that different from the twist kind of movies that have come before, and it seems like it should have been made in 2005, just at the tail end of that genre's popularity. You should check it out if you like DiCaprio. It's a great performance by him. Of course, check it out if you like Martin Scorsese and mysteries and kind of the detective genre as well. So that's it. Please leave some comments. Let's have a discussion. So until next time, choose your movies wisely because Story Corp is going to give us more of what we pay for. Long live good movies.